Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling. I play bass in the Australian metal band Lord. If you consider yourself a bit of a metalhead, you can get on over to lord.net.au and go and give us a crack. Hopefully, you will dig the tunes. I also host the Self Starter podcast over at selfstarter.com.au. If you're into small business, freelancing, self-employment, any of those things interest you, you can go over to selfstarter.com.au, give that a shot, and also you can search for it on your preferred podcast player. So go and check all that stuff out. I will love you a long time. Now, before I kick into this week's guest, I have to do my weekly show shout out my weekly thank you as i've been doing for every episode of 2018 and will hopefully continue in good habits do it for the whole year um <laughs> what this is is me sh- shouting out and doing a thank you to people that support the podcast in a varying number of ways whether it be leaving reviews on itunes or facebook or uh buying merch from the andysocial.net website or uh donating via the paypal link over there or sharing or tweeting um tagging mates, recommending uh, the, the episodes to other people, whatever it is, big or small, it all has a massive impact for me and the podcast. So I want to start saying thank you to people that do great things for me. So this week's shout out, this week's thank you is for Andrew Saltmarsh, Salty. Now, Salty's been on the podcast previously, I believe episode 85 or 87 or 86 or something like that, around that, around that time. Uh, Salty has been supporting the podcast for quite a while, obviously being on it, but um, he's left some reviews for me. Um, He's also designed my Christmas card that went out last year for 2017, a Christmas postcard. So anyone that would have got that in the post, that was designed by Salty, as you would have seen. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate everything that Salty does. And you should go over and check out Salty's podcast, The Hypothetical Institute. Go and search for that on your podcast player. Um, You can also find salty over at uh, andrew saltmarsh illustration on facebook if you search for him or um at saltmarsh as well on twitter so go and check all that stuff out also while i remember um you can also support toe hiders patreon page that uh, salty is obviously in and a part of um by going over to i'm just gonna have a I have no idea what the link is. I'm just going to say patreon.com slash toehider, maybe. Or maybe just go to Google and type in toehider Patreon. You'll find the page. Anyway, massive thank you to Salty. You've been a mate for many, many years, and I appreciate the ongoing support. So thank you very much, and I'll I'll send you out something in the post. I don't know what yet. I'll find some crap lying around the house. Cheers, anyway. All right, now, this week's guest is with Oscar McMahon. Now, Oscar is the owner of Young Henry's Brewery. Young Henry's Brewery? I think it's just Young Henry's. Anyway, one of the best beer brands in the country. Um, Local being in Sydney, Newtown based. uh, Really, really cool company. Um, Great beer. And uh, Oscar's also uh, a part of the Persian Drugs, which is a Sydney band, and was previously in the Hell City Glamours for about 15 years as well. So um, Oscar's been around the traps for quite some time. And uh, this this episode focuses more so on Young Henry's, but we definitely uh, cross over into the whole music realm and start comparing notes as far as um, what it's like playing in a band and doing a lot of DIY uh, work within a band and also how that's sort of translated into uh, running a business, uh, especially in sort of the beer industry as well. So really, really cool, interesting uh, chat with Oscar, Um, a great brand. You can go and check all that stuff out, go and search for Young Henry's. I'll have all the links to everything that we chat about in the show notes over at andysocial.net. So you can go and check that all out. So enough of me. (laughs) Please enjoy this episode with Oscar of Young Henry's. Thank you for having me here. Pleasure. Your lo- lovely establishment. Lots going on. Always. Just uh, chaos and mayhem. It's, um, and it wasn't even in the bar itself. No. It's just there people are, coming and going. There are always, you know, Monday to Friday, there's always just kegs flying everywhere, people coming and going, different people, you know, starting work, finishing work, <laughs> <laughs> starting drinking, finishing drinking. It's good. Never a dull moment. It's, it's not a... It's not a bad, not a bad uh, culture, not a bad vibe around the area. No, it is. It is pretty cool. It is a pretty good vibe. It's. It, what's really fun and unique about it is when you get to build your own company from the beginning. Yeah. It's it's a lot like starting a band. Mm. You get really excited about the idea about this is what we're going to do. Then you start adding the people that you want to it. And then all of a sudden you start creating these things which get other people excited by. 
and all of a sudden you see more people coming into you know in in to see you and more people you know in our case more people are buying the beers at you know bottle shops and in pubs and yeah. stuff like that and for all of us that are you know owners and partners but also people that work at young henry's it's become this thing where as it grows it's like when your band starts going well it's just this amazing sort of thing that you you start young henry's is a large part of my identity and mm. is a large part of a lot of our staff's yep. identity in yep. the same way that you know when you're in a band that band is a really important part of how you identify absolutely yeah you know with yourself and within the world and mm, that's a mm. big part of you know you're the one the one long-haired guy in the office because <laughs> oh he's the band guy you yeah. know what i mean <laughs> that's it yeah and uh I, I i kind of feel that playing in a band was the best was one of the best experiences for starting a business mm. because when you're in a band you make decisions based on what you think is cool and what you think is right for your band yep. which is essentially a brand mm. that you're protecting yeah and that is the best lesson when you're starting a business to learn to make decisions on what you think is cool or what you think you should do not based on a financial outcome mm -hmm. because when you're playing in a band it's very rare that you ever have the luxury of making a decision with a financial outcome, no, right? Not really. Not really. It's just where you're going to find the money more so than anything yeah, exactly. else. Not what's going to come in. Who who could we borrow from that we don't currently owe money to? <laughs> That's right. I'm running out of options here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to touch on this because, um, I mean, you were with Hell City Glamours for, what, 10, 15 years? Or? I, think we were, I think we called it quits at 14 years. Yeah, okay. So... I mean, you guys had a fair bit of success, got some really great shows, did some great tours. And um, I, at least, I mean, being in Sydney and being a Sydney sort of well, more or less a Sydney based band for us, I mean, you guys were everywhere as far as the way that you guys promoted yourselves, you were talked about in all the, all the, the right circles. And I was, the curious part of me was thinking the parallels between what you created now with this, with Young Henry's, what are the comparisons? What are the, the similarities between the two? And how much of uh, Hell City Glamours was DIY? Hell City Glamours was a really hardworking, really DIY band. Yeah. Um, we used to print all our own T-shirts. As in, we'd set up a screen in the apartment that me and Robbie used to um, used to borrow, uh, borrow rent. And we'd... Um, yeah, screen print all our own merch. We um, we did some runs of going to second hand shops and finding like denim jackets and stuff and nice. screen printing stuff like yeah. that. It, it was really d DIY. It was really hard working as well. We had, you know, we had rehearsals on Saturday and that was non negotiable. Hmm. If we were writing, there would be one or two other writing or you know maybe a band meeting or something. We would play shows. One year we one year we did I can't remember the exact number but it was basically uh, it was between 60 and 70 shows in a year mm. which for an Australian band is, really good. is pretty good yeah. um, with how spaced out it, everything is so we just we loved it we were all completely dedicated to it and we we worked really really hard and we, look, we just kept putting ourselves out, out there. Mm. You know, you, you've got to, anyone that, anyone that plays in a band knows that you've got to be relatively brave. Yep. You've got to go to different places where people haven't heard of you and you've got to try to push it. Yep. And try and win them over. Try to win them over <laughs> and you learn a lot. You learn a lot playing live yep. to cold rooms. Yeah. You know, if you think you've written a good song, go play it go play it in the front bar of a pub in Wollongong on a Thursday night when you're a glam band yeah <laughs> you'll find out pretty quick whether it's a good song or not yeah, yeah. you know um, we've had some pretty mixed reactions in cold yeah. rooms but we've you know we've had some really really excellent we had some really excellent reactions as well and 
I mean, I guess our band was all about the dream of like we're gonna play in this ultimate rock and roll band and just yeah. fucking have fun. Yeah, cool. And girls and partying and all that sort of stuff. And that was the focus of it. And we really enjoyed the music and the music got better as we practiced more and all that sort of stuff. It was never really driven to be financial necessarily, but we we I think we all held this out this hope that it was gonna be. Mm, yeah that it was going to become our jobs we're, yeah. it was going to become a real thing our first record got released in Europe and the UK for Classic Rock's Power Age yeah nice which was that was a really big thing for us and uh, we all had had high hopes about that and we were you know feeling pretty stoked about it and then we got accepted into South by Southwest uh, over in Texas and so we managed to get a grant for the Austra- from the Australian government and we planned this American tour mm. so we went over we played in LA and Texas and New York and and I remember coming back from that we had some meetings with some particular with some potential uh, American management and record yeah, companies cool. and stuff like that and basically just all of it fell through (laughs) (laughs) just nothing happened you know and I remember coming back and when we got back I kind of I personally felt a little bit sort of depressed because I felt like holy shit this isn't actually going to happen yeah (laughs) there's this crushing reality Reality, man of just like oh wow hang on yeah if it was going to happen, it would have just happened mm. or it would have happened by now. Or yeah. I, I don't know what the feeling was. And that was, that was sort of, that was kind of hard. And halfway through recording our second record, kind of realized that, you know, maybe the drive wasn't there anymore for us. Yeah. Not that, it, that not that the drive was related to making it or anything like that but no. it just I don't know just too much water had gone under the bridge I guess the perception changes a bit with Course. the whole thing yeah, yeah. 100% yeah. and what was really funny about that was that we made the decision instead of just breaking up we said well let's finish this record and let's put out the record and do a farewell tour yeah. as one thing mm. And that was a really cathartic, amazing thing to do mm. because that second, our second record, which probably no one has heard, <laughs> is really important to us because it's actually, a lot of the songs are about that realization and about that growing up, growing up in a band and realizing, shit, this is hard. This mm. isn't going to happen. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of songs on there about the whole experience and the, the beautiful times that we've had as a group of friends and... Man, that band offered us so many incredible experiences. I was going to say, would would all of this have happened without Hell City? Do you think you would have ended up in a similar spot anyway regardless? Or do you think it was sort of a natural sort of progression? I think that Hell City was a really formative experience for me. Yeah. It just... It taught me... I don't know. It taught me to believe in myself. Mm taught me to go with my gut taught me the value of good people around you you know it proved that you can actually do well doing something that you're really passionate about Mm. and that that only comes if you work fucking hard yeah yeah it was one of the funniest experiences actually on this one on the first night that we played a show with the Brides of Destruction yeah yeah me and Robbie were walking up from Archie's place and we're walking uh, to the venue and we were just saying, right, okay, if we meet them, they're just normal people and we're going to be cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to be cool. We're going to be chill. They're just like us. They're musicians. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Great. You know, we walk in, we're loading in our gear and we hear all this screaming outside and we we like sort of look up and Nikki Six just walks into this room that yeah, we're okay. loading gear in 
and me and Romy both just sort of like stand up dumb fucking look on our face you know, and, just, <laughs> and just both completely silent and he's he says you know hey guys we're tweeted the stage or whatever oh, that way. and you no know, both of us just completely silent and then both of us look at the other one like are you gonna say it are you gonna say it and then just both of us kind of just meekly pointed <laughs> and he was like yeah all right okay cool uh, so that was pretty embarrassing so that that sort of shows how much like we were just dumb kids right yeah but later on that night when we were setting up our merch the um the tool manager comes up and he goes oh guys just so you know you got a line price your merch mm-hmm. and uh and he goes li- line and we're like what, what do you mean line price he goes oh it's got to be the same as the headline act and we're like oh oh no we won't sell it then and he goes why not and we're like oh because all our shirts are just hand printed we yeah. do it ourselves and we don't want to rip anyone off <laughs> and the guy he's like went and asked the band and he came back and he goes, he goes man the boys think that's fucking cool sell them for whatever the fuck oh, you nice, want man nice. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, yeah that was one of our first big shows and the I don't know small reward for being uh, sticking to your guns sticking Just, to your guns yeah, and being yeah, DIY yeah. and yeah. actually understanding the value of you know of what you actually had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Having the hands-on uh, approach of actually creating your merch, you realise how low the cost was yeah. to slap it together. It's like, no, we're, we're not going to charge 40 bucks. And you weren't <laughs> valuing your time at that stage either. No, no, yeah. we weren't. We, there was no cost analysis on Hell City Glamour's <laughs> merchandise. Did you, did you have visions of creating this while you were still in the band or was it something that you were just trying to find a new creative endeavour to, to embark on after Hell City sort of wrapped itself up? Um, the idea for Young Henry's actually started around the time that we got back from the States. Yeah. So, I think I must have just been in this weird place where I realised that music was probably not going to be the thing. Mm. And so, what what am I doing? What am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? Yeah, yeah, and I was working in a pub and yeah. um, met this guy, Rich, who I really got along with and... We were running this beer club on one of the nights yeah. in the pub. And one night after beer club, Rich was just like, how cool would it be if we made a brewery that was in touch with the people like beer club was? Yeah. was like, yeah, it's sick. Why don't we just, why don't we just do that? <laughs> I guess it was a silly drunk conversation which got followed up on at a time where he was just finishing up with a particular job. Mm. And I was in this sort of shift mentally of, well where am I going what am I doing that just lined up really well and you need a lot of energy to sink into you know new projects and I guess I felt like maybe I'd had the energy yeah Mm, yeah did you was it a case of just creating a couple of different beers and just doing just to supply to mates and like you're in a circle to begin with or was or did you already sort of have did you have the vision in place already? You know how some people talk when in business terms, they go, oh, you know, you gotta have your, you gotta have your vision, you gotta know where you're going. Did you sort of have that early in the piece or was it something that just over time when you got the reaction from people that you sort of thought, oh, okay, now I can see where the potential is in this? I feel like we had an idea originally that sort of skewed, sort of skewed once we started rolling. Mm. And we just started, everything that we really liked as people just became, well, that's what we'll do. Well, that's what we'll do. Let's just do this. This is fun. This is cool. Where do we want to stock our beer? Let's write a list of people that we think are great and let's go hit them up and try to sell beer to them. Yeah. Because then our beer is only in places that we really dig. Yeah. Which will be good for our brand, right? Yeah, cool. Seems really simple. Yeah. It's like, like with a band, you know, you don't want to play in a shit room because then everyone will be like, oh, well, that band's not doing so well. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, that's like, it. Yeah. Um, look, to, to be perfectly honest, there was no, there was absolutely no plan of... See, Baz. There was no plan of us getting even past the first year, really. Yeah, like, yeah. there was... 
there was definitely no plan of us getting to it's here. It's just a cool idea. Something to... Yeah, it was just something. We're just going to get into in and, and get it done, yeah. you know? And... Everyone was... But everyone was really dedicated to it. You know, f- failure wasn't an option mm. that we were even considering. Yeah. So, no plan, but no failure, I guess. Just a firm belief that what we're doing was right. You said earlier about... Um, the comparisons with being in a band and, and finding mates to get your band started and a similar sort of thing with starting a business and trying to find the right people. Um, like one thing that I've always had a challenge with is I'm never short of an idea, always got an idea. In fact, I'm so bad with ideas that I've got a book that I have to write the ideas in just to get them out of my head and not be distracted like a shiny object. And then I start neglecting the things that I've been work- been working on. But a, part of, a problem with that on top of just that alone is that I'm quite possessive over them. And I find it hard to find people in my head that I could work with and trust that they will be there for the long term and that they're going to be engaged and they're going to be as dedicated as me on my idea or whatever I've come up with. Um, Band's a little bit different. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's exactly the same thing. You know when you... Let's say you come up with the idea for a song, right? Yeah. You've written written this, this great chorus and great structure for a song. And it sounds pretty good when you play it by yourself. But when you've got four other people in the room with you adding in a whole bunch of different things that you can't do Mm. all of a sudden that's when it becomes an actual song which other people are really excited by yeah that's the simplest analogy for business as well did you struggle with finding those people to begin with like was it was it you're in a circle of mates that you sort of leaned on to begin with and get them or did you actually seek It, it was a bit of a hodgepodge at the beginning because we had to we had to find we had to get money together to, yep. to, to install a brewery, you know? It was capitally intensive. Couple of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> so we um, had this sort of business plan prospectus sort of document that we got out to a few people that managed to find its way into a few cool people's hands. And we sort of started out. When you start a band, you need a drummer. Mm. You need a bass player you know when you're starting a business you need money you need business partners Mm. so if you've got people from different backgrounds you know you you don't want to have you don't want to have four Oscars in a company you know what I mean (laughs) you just there's one of me there's one of him there's one you know if you have multidisciplinary people all working towards the same sort of vision Mm that's when you're able to get through the startup stage of a business yeah yeah because look no one's going to be paying themselves <laughs> yeah that's right absolutely and you got to find people that are dedicated and understand the vision understand where it's going to go and see the potential absolutely and if everyone everyone needs to bring their skill set to the table mm. so we had you know we had someone who was a brewer we had someone who was a carpenter we had someone from IT we had someone doing our accounts we had someone doing sales you know it's all all of that just having those different expertise that we didn't have to pay because they were all vest, had vested interest yeah, yeah. that's what got us through the first year yeah you know yeah if we were paying salaries in the first year we would have gone under yeah <laughs> like yeah absolutely it's you know it's which is so weird to think about it you're starting a business and you know cash flow is so bad <laughs> let's see I mean your expenses are so high at least well for a lot of people it takes multiple years to even recoup a large percentage of that back and get into a, into a position where you're making any form of profit mm. so I mean this business has been up and running for what four no it, probably nearly now, six, six years, years six yeah. years yeah yeah so we'll be turning six in April, actually. Yeah, yeah. Did um, obviously having the right people come into the mix and work alongside the idea and being a part of the business is is critical to what you've been able to achieve. But partnerships in the area. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to. Some people get a bit insulted by the term, but to me, looking at Young Henry's, it's not. It's not a beer brand. I mean, it, it is that's what you're selling but it's like a lifestyle brand 
and lifestyle lifestyle brand sounds a little bit ugh. yeah i yeah. get that but 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 it encompasses so much more there's like an attitude there's a lifestyle attached to it there's some sort of like when you look at it and like think the way that you guys partner up with different businesses and especially in newtown as well where it's all sort of originating where you're based there's a certain vibe and a certain attitude that that comes with it of course well i mean as a company we, we know what we stand for yeah you know we support live music we support artists we support local pubs we also support and donate to charity social issues local cool. issues yeah we believe in fun we let our crew inform you know the the shape the color the flavor of our brewery you mm. know and of, of our business yeah that's a really big thing is that if you allow your business to have more than one songwriter <laughs> yeah, yeah you know you've actually got a whole lot more potentially interesting things yeah. going on i think what's really cool about being a beer brand as well is that it's really easy for a beer brand to support things that are cool yeah if there's a band coming through town that we really like they can pop in and pick up some beer, take it, we'll drop off rider to where they're playing. Super easy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If it was a restaurant, we'd have to get them in for dinner. Yeah. You know, and I think one of the, the great things, the thing I love about the beer industry is that it is, it's really fun. Everyone that is in the beer industry is generally in it for the right reasons, you mm. know, for good, good times. And beer is just a it's a leveler it's a really it's a it's a revered australian pastime yep it's a social lubricant it really is yep. but it has it has social importance mm. yep. and it can it can be this thing that you don't even think about or it can be the only time i catch up with my best mate is when we're sitting down having beers <laughs> yeah. you know it's like yeah. wow yeah. so you mean that when you catch up with your best mate our beer is involved yeah. that's amazing you know that's a really <laughs> yeah. incredible thing yeah. noel gallagher said one time he said that he is always super stoked to think that every night for them is someone else's the night of their month or their mm. three months or yeah. their year yeah. yeah you know and that's one of the things i loved about working in a pub or a bar you know is that you're there when someone is commiserating or celebrating or they've just had a shitty day and they're coming in just to feel better. Yeah, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And that's what that's what's cool about beer, is that we get hit up all the time for beers for weddings and for wakes or people just coming in, you know, after work to just... It complements a large amount of things yeah. just in, in, in a person's everyday life. And it's not even... And it's not even um, it's not even segregated to a certain class of per person. No. It's not. It's not like a like some for some people. You know, you play rock, you play metal, or you play punk, or something like that. You might have a bit of crossover here and there, but for the most part, you've got your niche. And something like beer, while you do create a a vibe and an attitude around it, and a, and a, a certain lifestyle around it, it's still something that everybody can have absolutely you're, and not, you're not just pitching it for one type of person a guy who's 25 and only likes this type of music and this type these type of things or pop culture references or whatever it is that, that's absolutely it i think that what we're seeing now when craft beer sort of really came onto the fore mm. it was very niche yeah and what we're seeing now is brands like like us making what i'd refer to as pub craft yeah you know yeah. you buy it in jugs you drink yeah. it with your mates <laughs> and your mates are men and your mates are women yeah it's 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 genderless it's yeah you know beer is for everybody yeah in the same way that rosé can be for everybody yeah, yeah. you know yeah. that there's no gender to certain alcohols but we're actually seeing that translating into actual sales now yeah that's cool which is really cool yeah so um i really love that you know my wife and i when we go out with our friends there'll be jugs on the table there'll be bottles of wine and you cannot tell the gender of the person by the drink you know <laughs> <laughs> it's good it's yeah good. it really is you're breaking a lot of stereotypes and a lot of that stuff's just i think people are 
over the years gone by anyway I've been very self-conscious about how they're portrayed and what their image is and what complements their image or what's expected in society you know mm. uh, I'm a lady so I only drink this so I drink wine or I drink rosé and whatever it is or if I'm a guy I'm only going to drink a lager and that's it and if I, I can't be seen drinking any of that wine shit you know I look like a Sheila so there's that sort of old school mentality which a lot of that's gone now yeah a lot of that's gone and it's fantastic because now you can you can order a drink without uh, feeling <laughs> feeling judged it's really good it's really good that it's is a great thing about beer like and what you've done is that you you don't have to worry about niching to to one type of person well that's it's a really funny thing talking about like the the business plan sort of idea mm. right we always try to make decisions or do i think this is cool yeah so when we make beers we make beers for us yeah we don't try to second guess what someone else some faceless someone out mm. there might be thinking and let's try and create a beer that is going to lure that person in yep so many so many marketing dollars w- would have been wasted yeah absolutely, absolutely on beer companies trying to predict what someone else might want it's like no man it's like well, it's been a bit of that of you course. can see it in their advertising man yeah, yeah. it's field of dream stuff <laughs> just if you if you brew it they will drink it as long as you like it that's fine yeah I think um, a big thing that I've seen and I've spoken about quite a bit with people just getting started on anything themselves creating something being creative is that people more so than ever before are able to sniff out bullshit yeah so if you're not authentic and you're trying to you know build yourself up for to try and win somebody else over and you're being inauthentic in that way people people can sniff it out and you don't you don't stand the, te- the test of time and i think maybe in years gone by you could probably go away with that a little bit more but now things are so much more transparent i agree and people have got so many options at their fingertips it's not just four channels on the tv anymore or you know or is there even tv anymore so you know there's always there's so many more options for people to do pastimes options of food and drink and everything and so now people can be far more selective mm. it's sort of the same thing with with bands as well in that you should always you know when you're when you're when you're playing in a band make sure you're playing in a band that you really truly love mm. and that you really like the music of and that you totally stand behind yeah because there are going to be times that that's what gets you through the hard times yeah yeah is when you enjoy playing the music you're going to enjoy it when there's five people in the room. Yeah, that's right, yeah. You know? Toowoomba, yeah, that, that reminds me of Toowoomba. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I, I did a beer event in Toowoomba a couple of years ago, oh, yeah. and it was sort of similar, except I had, <laughs> had the ability to get a whole bunch of <laughs> locals drunk for oh, free, yeah, and that, okay. that warms a room up, I'll tell you yeah, that. I so it does. <laughs> if, <laughs> yeah, you know, more, more independent bands should set up bar tabs for their punters. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, it can be onto something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, because independent bands have got, you know, they're usually flush with cash and they can afford to oh, do that, it, right? That's it, Yeah, just just uh, expand that budget out a little yeah, bit yeah. more. Yeah. We've already hit a grand. Yep. Take it to 1500 by <laughs> Keith. Yeah. But you're right, though. It's, um, you know, even from a punter's point of view, you go and see a band in a, in a tiny, tiny room. If you're watching that band and it's, they're energetic and they're loving it, doesn't matter who else is in that room doesn't matter if the sounds bouncing off the walls in the empty mm. room or anything like that or the sounds a bit tinny or whatever it is you're watching them it's entertaining you can see that they love it and it's this energy thing that goes back and forth so you know it's it's that it's that authentic aspect that that travels or transcends yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah that, i think i think you're you're spot on there people can tell when it's bullshit yeah you know we've been we've been marketed to for our whole lives we we know the difference when someone's legit and when someone's trying to sell us something. Yeah. And that's what's really funny is seeing I see a lot of other companies how they react in a marketing space. Mm. And just I don't know. If you don't if you don't believe it, what's the point? Yeah, absolutely. And at least from from what I've seen and seeing the young henry's brand in various places it's always been associated with with culture community um and it's been partnered in with something else and in some cases it's, it's just a compliment to whatever the whatever that other thing is so if it's part of another of, of a pub or it's part of like an art 
exhibition or um, a partnership with another alcohol company. I know it was Jameson yeah. or something from last yeah, year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's like a compliment. It's complimenting. It's not just overshadowing and going, hey, this is us, this is us, and it's this hard sell in your face. It's like we're also here and we're helping and we're supporting and actually doing something for the greater good. We've always thought that it's more fun to have fun with other people than it is alone. Yep. You know, it's like if you can if you can put an event together, what's going to be more fun? Just a Young Henry's event, or is it like when you're putting on a gig and you can put on your band and your mates' band and another band that you've seen around that you really dig their music, and all of a sudden there's crossover, there's more people in the room, there's a vibe, and everyone gets psyched. It's such a no-brainer. Yeah. You know, it's so simple. Just also people get bored if you're just talking about yourself. <laughs> and they really do. Yeah. That's why I try and get guests on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> don't wanna don't wanna talk about myself that much. They're already sick of my voice. But you're right, you're absolutely right. And and there's only so many times that you can get away with just highlighting yourself only. There's only so many times and after a while people get very tired of it very quickly. Exactly, right? Yeah. Um so I, I have to ask you because um, this has obviously been well it appears to have been a big thing for you guys um, a few weeks back doing a bit of a a bit of a thing with uh, the Foo Fighters yeah it was unexpected where I went oh my god that's huge but at the same time I went not surprised though you know what when when that opportunity came to us it was one of those just oh fuck moments yeah <laughs> Like, wow, that's pretty amazing. And they they look they they're touring crew. Uh, they they people were asking around some people in Australia. We want to make a beer mm. for this tour in Australia. Who who should we do it with? Yeah. And they'd been told on a couple of different occasions that oh you you need to do it with Young Henrys. Mm. And that was through us working with independent bands and different people in the music industry and different music venues mm. and through you know putting on putting on the festival that we Just put on two years thing. in a row yeah from doing things legitimately yeah. that's how we got this amazing opportunity so the, and it got offered to us you know what I mean was it a case of you guys getting a call or an email from from their management or like a middle person just saying hey here's a proposition yeah we, we got a phone call yeah we got a phone call from someone um from basically saying look i've been hit up by management what do you think about this idea and we were like wow okay that's pretty cool <laughs> then we got linked in with their management and they said you know we've done something like this over in England before mm. but you know just in just in a little pub how would you guys see it see it going and mm. we said well look how would you feel about a national release of you know food town cans <laughs> milk and, it and they were like well <laughs> let's do this that's cool yeah it's really cool man it's pretty it was, wild we took our whole crew to the to the gig and that's cool had a big wild night yeah <laughs> absolutely because uh, there was there was two pop-ups yeah. So one in Melbourne, one here in Sydney as well. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then and then the cans are going right around the country. Yeah, right. Wow. Did um I mean I don't know what sort of what sort of volumes you guys pump out on on a normal day a week, but did you guys really have to up the ante for something like that or was it sort of I mean because it was a different it was a different brand altogether that you guys were creating yeah. was unique for well, it, it it was a one off and t to be honest, we didn't want to milk it too hard. Yeah. We didn't want to we don't, we don't want this to still be in shops in six months. Like, you want to oh, keep the dead horse. Exactly. Yeah. So we actually did a pretty small amount. Yep. So it's probably going to be all gone in, within the next month or so. Yeah, cool. cool. Um, all of our stocks are already out. Yeah. <laughs> so there will be some bottle shops that hold it. But we thought, look, it's an amazing opportunity. But yeah, let's not, not drag it out. Let's just have fun yeah absolutely it's a feather in the cap and move on well, that's it and i think it's just a, well it's it's definitely the feather in the cap i mean you know who knows what just from what you guys have done in the past by just doing things that you want to do being legitimate and then that leads to that opportunity and then you do something like this where it's just like okay well here's a little tick that we can put on our our long list of uh, things that we've been associated with and achievements 
what happens in the future who knows what uh, what other things or unexpected moments come along it, it definitely sort of opens up the realms of you know mentally what's possible yeah and that's really, that's really that's a really interesting sort of feeling yeah. like wow well I guess well if we've done that <laughs> but you don't want to get too ahead of yourself either and yeah. I think that the most important thing for us to remember is the reason that we did this the reason we got this opportunity is because of all the legit work that we do in supporting independent Australian artists mm, mm. and so you can't turn your back on that you yeah. can't you know can't go chasing your next food fighters and forget about your DC death phrase yeah. you know like <laughs> yeah, yeah, really yeah. honestly so that's an important thing for us yeah definitely and I know you've been asked this quite a bit so I did a little bit of uh, stalking online but I'm gonna ask it anyway so no doubt you've been approached by some of the bigger guys as far as cause I know a lot of other beer brands in Australia have been bought out or there's been some deals that have been struck I mean you can you can say as much as you want or, or as little as you want but I mean do you guys get approached when people can see that you guys are doing good things look we've never had anyone give us an offer and we're not we're not looking yeah. we're not for sale yeah. you know if we sold this business I'd be selling my job I'd be selling I'd be selling something which I really love and I'd have to sit back and watch someone fuck it up yeah yeah you know that's not it's a tough thing to swallow yeah it really is like I, I have a, a really good life working at a job which I'm really passionate about for a company which I helped start a couple of months back I was up up in Snake Eyes Snake Eyes with uh, Cindy having a chat and I said to him I go you have a dream job like you live around the corner you love Newtown you've been a part of Newtown for so many years you play in bands you've been playing bands for god knows how long you love doing your art you make money off it now you got all these other side hustles going on and your office is in the young henry's compound <laughs> and and you get beer so you know you, you're you're doing your dream job that guy basically he draws skulls and dicks on things I and gets love paid it. it's amazing <laughs> dude <laughs> I see, I see. Um, I started following his Death Patches page, and then it's just chicks with uh, their tops off with patches all over them. I thought, oh, there you go, Cindy. So you, you're it's doing, hard work, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I see the same sort of thing with what you're doing, and I think, you know, you've no doubt been a part of this area for so long as well. You played in bands, you know, all of the things that you're interested in and you're passionate about are shown in this. And as you said, like it's this is what you love doing, and this is your job, and this is you've created this thing from from nothing. So to have it and to have it here as well, where it's located, is just like the most incredible thing. I think it's so cool from a punter point of view. Like, and someone who lives sort of never lived in Newtown, but I lived in St Peter's, close enough. Definitely, but it's, yeah, it's in the hood. Man. Yeah, it's in the hood. But you know, you see, there's a bit of pride, and I could definitely understand people that have lived here for years and years and years would have a sense of pride knowing that a place like this is here. Uh, absolutely Newtown is a fiercely proud colourful place mm. people will fight to protect people's right to be who they are yeah. and what they want to be and they will support local businesses they support people you know having a go yeah it's it's really it's really it's a really beautiful place my wife and I both went to high school at Newtown High and we now live next to Newtown High which is really strange <laughs> and Newtown sort of when I started year 7 Newtown High I remember walking in and just walking down King Street and just being like oh my god what is this place yeah. <laughs> just mind blown and it's just shown me so many really important things mm. in life you you know New, Newtown shows shows you actual multiculturalism working successfully it shows you every type of music every type of restaurant every type of bar pub it, it's a place where people come out for a good time it's also a place where people don't mind other people having a good time and everyone is mindful that their good time doesn't ruin other people's good times yeah, yeah. you know there's this there's a social conscience 
it's a really special place. Yeah. It really is. And I owe it a lot. And I feel that young Henry's really loves and respects Newtown and I, f- I hope that we give back enough, you know, to, to make that right. I think you guys are on the right track. I hope so. I really hope so, you know. It's a, um, I don't know, Newtown has, Newtown has protected and supported us and I hope we do the same for Newtown. So with that in mind, I assume that there's just um, not even in a long-term vision that you would ever sort of consider seeing yourself, seeing this business anywhere else. Like maybe, maybe getting, maybe bigger, but as far as, you know, as far as a Newtown based business. I would like to think that there was always part of our business is in this same site. Mm. Um, As we grow, there is just not enough industrial footprint left in Newtown. So sadly, I think in the next couple of years, we're probably going to have to move part of our operations to a more industrial spot, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, there's still plenty around the inner West, Mm. but I think that this, this, this is our brand home. This is where it all began. So then something needs to retain Mm. and something always will. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, it is. It's fucking frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you, as you said earlier before we started recording, uh, you know, the bigger you get, the bigger your problems and challenges. <laughs> yeah, but, that's exactly uh, it. But it's also the rewards are big as well. So you take you take the good and the bad. Yeah, mate. It's like it's like it's like high stakes gambling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. But um, man, like, thank you so much. I'm so impressed. I'm a massive fan, and. Um, and I'll say the same thing I said to Cindy. You're doing doing a dream job, and the fact that you own it as well is even better. So Thanks, that's, man. That's cool. Really appreciate your time, bro. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, folks. If you want to reach out to Oscar or you want to get your grubby mitts on a young Henry's, um, well, you can probably just go to any bottle shop in Australia. I think they're pretty much everywhere these days. But otherwise, you can go to andysocial.net and I will have all the links and contact details for Oscar, young Henry's, Hell City Glamours, the Persian drugs, everything that we spoke about will be in the show notes over at andysocial.net. So get on over there and uh, check it all out. Now, before I wrap up this week's episode, um, a bit of a shout out to the Lord fans listening into this podcast for those that pre-ordered the prog power usa live cd limited edition cd um, that we had up and available for pre-order in december and january just a quick message if you haven't received an email from me by now um, there was a slight delay in production but rest assured they will be out and uh, by the time you're listening to this you'll either have received your cd or that it will be in transit you'll get it soon but um we're really really excited for you guys to have it it's been a long time coming because uh the show that was recorded was from 2016 and we've spent a lot of time just making sure that this is uh you know cleaned up and sounding really really good we've also spent a lot of time with uh, the three unreleased lord bonus tracks on this cd as well which we haven't told anyone what they are yet so i think you've probably some of you guys would have heard some teasers online through the dominus uh, records facebook and instagram pages but we're really really excited and waiting anxiously to hear what you guys think of them so uh really hope you enjoy it and thank you so much for supporting i've really spent a lot of time doing direct messages uh for the pre-order campaign for this cd because you know what it's like with social media not everything reaches everybody emails don't always get opened or go to junk mail so i I really went above and beyond to contact as many people to give the opportunity for people to pre-order the CD. And I must say that the uptake for this was one of the best that we've ever had in the history of this band. So it's great to see after so many years that you guys are still loving what we do. And obviously we're loving it as well, but um, it just means a hell of a lot. And we've been put in a really good position now in a very, very favorable position to fund the next album. Um, which is a long time coming. It's been since 2013 when the last album, Digital Lies, came out. So we're um, we're in a good position, and that means that we're going to get to that uh, album a lot quicker now with um, some financial backing from you guys by supporting uh, through the pre-orders of this uh, CD. So thank you very much. Now, also, um, before I forget, um, and I literally just forgot, as I said, the word forget. Um, oh, yeah, of course. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um if you wanted to get a copy of this CD, this Prog Power live 
limited edition CD. There are a few copies left. There was only 500 printed up and they're almost gone. But in the next week or so, I'm going to put up the last remaining copies. They're all going to be signed and they're going to be available through the Lord Bandcamp page. So if you just go over to lord.net.au in about a week's time from uh, airing of this episode, you should be able to order yourself the, one of the last remaining copies of this CD. This will not be repressed, blah, 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 you know, the usual spiel. Um, it's just not worth repressing something like this. It's available digitally for people to listen forever and ever. Um, but if people want a souvenir, something to put on their shelf, then you can get one of these limited edition CDs. It's really, really cool. And it has these bonus tracks on there that aren't available anywhere else as it stands as it stands right now. So I don't know whether they're going to end up somewhere else later on down the track, maybe different versions of them. I'm going to stop rambling. All right, guys, uh, before I wrap it up very quickly, if you want to support this podcast, as always, you can get on over to andysocial.net. You can buy uh, Andy Social merch by going through the link on andysocial.net to the Bandcamp page. I've got Andy Social t-shirts. I've got a USB pass that has the first 100 episodes of the podcast, nice and easy in one little tight package. Um, there's also other stuff. There's more Can Andy t-shirts. I've just put that stuff up. If you guys know about Mork and Andy, then you can go over there, check that out. It's all on the Dominus Records Bandcamp page, which all of us fall under. That's Lord, uh, From Beyond, Black and Angel, Serenity Defile, Clarity, Mork and Andy, Andy Social Podcast. Uh, did I say Clarity? Maybe. Anyway, there's heaps of us that fall under the, the Dominus umbrella, so you can get on over there and check it out. But, uh, you know, apart from those things and shouting me a beer via the andysocial.net page, you can... Um, I don't know, just the usual stuff, you know, liking, sharing, retweeting, tagging, all that social media love. Um, any recommendations to mates goes a long way and uh, it really means a hell of a lot to me. So as always, thank you so much. Enough crapping on from me. Until next week, guys, take care. Ta-ta. Ta-ta.